Thank you for joining us for the AMTA Grand Rounds Music Therapy Practice in a COVID-19 World. My name is Seneca Block, and I'm currently serving as a member of the AMTA COVID-19 Task Force, the sponsor of this Grand Round series. We hope you enjoyed hearing some of the submissions to the AMTA COVID-19 Songwriting Contest as we gathered. There's still time to submit your original song by October 15th. Please visit musictherapy.org under latest news for the information. We also encourage you to view the many resources on the AMTA COVID-19 webpage and reach out to us with any questions. Today's session is going to be titled, Are You Still There? The Burdens and Benefits of Hospice Music Therapy Telehealth. Uh, our presenter today is Brittany Tachkov. Uh, Brittany Tachkov is a board certified music therapist. She started the music therapy program at Hospice of East Bay in Pleasant Hill in May of 2017. Since graduated in 2014, Brittany has primarily worked in hospice and palliative care and completed her hospice and palliative care music therapy certification. Just prior to the start of Shelter in Place in San Francisco Bay Area, Brittany had expanded the program, successfully advocating for a second full-time music therapy position, and since then, the program has been able to sustain two full-time caseloads and a wait list of music therapy referrals throughout the pandemic. Brittany has a passion for presenting and sharing about hospice in the music therapy community, including guest lectures on hospice music therapy at the University of the Pacific. With no further ado, I introduce Brittany Tachkov. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, before we get too far into everything, um, I realize that we're still in the pandemic and some of you may have not taken a moment to pause and breathe. So let's first just take a moment. Um, if you have been doing telehealth, maybe close your eyes or look uh, at a distance. I know I've been looking at a screen a little bit too much today. Um, and so if we can just take one moment to maybe look to the side or close your eyes if you're comfortable, you can turn off your screen. Um, and then just take a deep breath in and out. Two more in and out. One more in. And out. We're going to start off the presentation with a poll. I want to get to know you guys a little bit, those who are here live, uh, and that will help me know what to focus on and maybe encouraging some of you to join in in the comment section if you have additional stories or thoughts as we go along. So I believe Andrea is in charge of our poll. Just wanting to know what your experience level is in hospice and what is your topic of interest based on what I plan on presenting today. So based on that, it looks like we have a mix of folks joining us. Um, for those who have been working in hospice for a few years or are experienced, I'm going to encourage you to contribute as much as you feel comfortable or if you have any additions or stories to add to the chat box and it looks like interventions are going to be a key area of interest so that's where we might be focusing on i'm am still going to start with the data so let me share my screen burdens and benefits so i'm hoping that you can walk away with at least one intervention that you can utilize in music therapy hospice work and telehealth and two methods for trying to create a space that allows for that. Um, I want to start with a, just a big disclaimer that I am not an expert in telehealth and hospice music therapy. I have three months of data and six months of experience. So this is really just based on that time frame. And this is accountability data. So this is what I uh, was tracking on my own that could be used to report my caseload and workload to uh, my agency and it is not as rigid as research. So shelter in place. You guys 
might be familiar with this timeline, this is what the timeline looked like in California. So that means that there was about that three months where it was really telehealth and telephone, maybe a little bit of visiting outside the window. And then um, this transition into a hybrid mode where now I am going into the home or I may be um, doing more window visits, more accessibility in person. And here's what the types of visits look like. Um, this was for about 60 patients who were receiving um, services for a three month period. So primarily video visits, primarily telephone visits, and then there was a little bit of a hybrid of both and outside visits. Um, there was a shift in practice as far as who was receiving services, um, where it's still primarily patient and family or uh, just the patient, but now there was also this expansion into just for the family members in some of those cases. I was assessing new patients and taking on new referrals during this period. So about 50% had been referred to me after shelter in place started. And then this is where we'll take a bigger focus. So what was I doing when I was trying to engage with patients and families? Um, this is what I was doing just on the telephone. Uh, reflective songwriting was very big, particularly for just family support or for those patients where the patient might be benefiting, but I was on speakerphone, I couldn't see the patient, the patient was nonverbal, and it was really the family member who had to translate if anything was happening as far as the patient reaction. But I could clearly document that the family member was able to engage in songwriting with me, was able to dedicate a song for the patient who was nonverbal, may have been transitioning, may have been closer to actively dying. Um, legacy work via email. So being able to exchange um, words, of course, through secure email, um, or uh, creating song lists and playlists. And this was great um, more for those alert and oriented patients who um, really thrived on using technology, um, particularly thinking about those with ALS, but they can still use their hands. So they might not already be nonverbal. Um, and now they have this mode of connecting with me and it continues the work, the music therapy work outside of the session. Um, Music-based life review of you know, some of those verbal based um, music techniques, right? So talking about different um, songs and we might just be straight talking about it or depending on how they feel about me singing over the phone, um, we could still talk about the song after I sing it and what memories are related to that song. Um, of course, sound quality is a little bit iffy on a telephone um, and that's where you really have to ask the patient and family. How does this sound? So stop after the first line or stop after the first verse or like a little piece of the chorus and ask, uh, is it okay if I continue? Can you hear me well enough? Um, or I did that a lot with, can you hear the keyboard if someone used to maybe play the piano? And so incorporating the keyboard over the phone, over speakerphone, I'm checking with them to see what is their perceived uh, quality as far as, as sound and being ready to stop that at any point. A lot of education and, to, and support to family. Um, and that looked like, how are you using music in the home? Um, what does music look like in your life, in your own coping? And that again is where sometimes when we're focusing on just the family over the phone, um, it can be really helpful to also cue into how music can be their mode of communicating, expressing, and processing just as much as the hospice patient. Uh, I still had patient-led singing and musically cued singing, so leaving the last word out of a phrase and having the patient over the phone fill in that blank. A lot of people really love to continue to connect in that way, even if maybe speech-wise they didn't need that cueing, it 
allowed for this interactive element in the music. So we didn't have to be completely synchronized in order for me to leave space for them to sing maybe half and half. I take one line, they take another line. Um, there was still that engagement that could happen just over the phone. And then um, personalized songs. This was a really big one for when I had to use uh, a family member or a caregiver as my, what I like to call translators. They're telling me, are their eyes open? Are their eyes closed? Um, did they nod their head? Did they um, look towards the phone? When they're the ones that are giving me that, I, I want to personalize the songs maybe with their name or with something I learned about them um, pre-COVID or from the family member who maybe isn't able to visit. Personalized songs was very big in the uh, facilities or other arenas where families weren't able to get in. And so I could take the family member's words and give it to the patient through a song over the phone. Um, and it, again, it was just key to have those translators as I was using these different interventions. And then we have video and that expands what we can do um, into all of these interventions. And um, one of the big differences was of course the visually cued elements. Um, what for those, especially those who are hard of hearing, video was pretty important in order for them to have that cue. I know one uh, patient I worked with where um, if I tried to do straight phone, that would not work. They weren't really engaging in that level. Um, maybe they could still have that sense of support that comes with personalized songs. Um, and there was a huge difference once we could figure out FaceTime. And once we found out, oh, the caregiver has an iPhone or I, the nurse has the iPhone, and now that they can look even at this tiny little phone screen, uh, now they were able to engage and, um, and just be a part of that, that um, experience and then singing with me and, and having that kind of interaction. Um, another piece is symptom management. I never did symptom management goals over just phone. That really required a certain level of visual um, in order for me to make sure that I could track some of that as well as coordination with the nurse. And we'll get into more of those details. But um, using music as an alternate point of focus, I could still do through video um, and through FaceTime, which was my primary modality through this period. Uh, we added in group singing. There was a little bit more that I could facilitate as far as guiding the group space. I could even um, facilitate family and supporting opportunities for instrument play. There's a tambourine in the one home, so we could incorporate their tambourine to place under their loved one's hand. Um, I could visually cue them in ways that they could use their bodies or um, reinforce the little bits of tapping that might have um, been displayed by the fam uh, by the patient and so then maybe the family members are also starting to tap with them or maybe they're just tapping on their shoulders a little bit and I can still monitor through the video uh, how the patient is responding to those kind of cues so there was actually quite a bit that I could still do all the way pared down to basically FaceTime and phone So our considerations and our benefits. A big thing as a clinician, so the consideration for me was how do I interact and collaborate with the nurses, with caregivers, with staff. And some of the time, it's easy. You have that rapport with that one nurse who will carry you with them no matter where you go. <laughs> and they're happy to support music therapy. And there are others who are feeling very burdened, who are only able to see this one patient at this one time. And we have to have a lot of flexibility. And when I say flexibility, I mean, you think you're going to see them at 10 o'clock and then it gets pushed 
15 minutes and then it gets pushed an hour and then it gets pushed two hours. Has anyone experienced this? I see a head nod or two <laughs> where uh, you think you're going to do a 10 o'clock visit and then it's 4 p.m. Um, so how do we as uh, clinicians ex even expand the definition of flexibility, which we've all had to do in these times um, and assess for burden while also not being afraid to ask our nurses, to ask our home health aides, to ask a staff member who is able to visit in person, is there any chance that I can come with you? Um, I know my colleague has had amazing experiences with home health aides who will just start singing with him. And so now we have a live music component that is coming through alongside the music therapist assisting. Assessing and giving opportunities um, for connections. So this is, um, of course, ongoing, but I felt like as a clinician, I was also looking for windows for other team members to get in or for family members to get in. How is it that I am able to connect and would this, for example, if a nurse is the reason that I'm able to see my patient, is the nurse comfortable doing FaceTime with the daughter who is very distressed at not being able to see their mom for a month or two um, and is ready to just barrel in <laughs> to the facility or into the uh, boarding care? So how is it that we can use what we are able to do in ways that we're able to connect to also offer that connection to others? Another example is uh, just like the intervention that I described. How can we bring in the family members' words and love and support for the patient and then report that back and say, you know, I shared all of these words all of these loving words that you were telling me about um, to your to your mom to your sibling and um, and here's how they responded and I think you know this this is thanks to you and thanks to your words as clinicians we need to have some verbal skills in our toolbox there is a lot in the music therapy world about, of course, leaning in to music and the power of music and music is a modality for change, 100%. I think that that is a huge piece of what we have to offer and really creates amazing opportunities for change and connection and support across populations. And sometimes, especially in these times of a pandemic when we are having to use our words even more, um, have even more barriers to getting in, that when we can have some verbal skills that such as just active listening or reflecting back statements, we can lead that into music therapy interventions. So my verbal skills of asking, well, how would you describe your loved one? I can't even see, you know, I don't know if I've ever used the word, I can't even see them, but in my head I'm thinking, I can't even see them, I really don't know them. Um, I only know their medical chart or I only know what the nurse has observed because the psychosocial team isn't in there. And being able to turn that potentially into songwriting, um, is it okay? I'm about to sing, sometimes I, I warn people, depending on how I feel like the relationship is over the phone, I'm about to sing some of the words that you used to describe your spouse or your, your um, parent. Are, is that okay? And let me know if I'm getting it right. And so then I'll sing back some of what they used to describe their loved one. And that started with a lot of just listening to them, asking, meaning-based questions um, and not leading with the music, but sometimes leading with the verbal skills to open that door for music therapy interventions. And then considering how our role can be expanded in the care team. So when I'm collaborating with nurses and caregivers and staff, I am also caring for nurses and caregivers and staff. 
I'm also checking in with them as part of my um, scheduling process. So how are you doing? <laughs> how have things been going? Um, how has your experience been today? And I found that that also created relationships so that it could really be a cycle of benefit. I am trying to support them just with a brief check in. It doesn't have to be hearing their life story, but it, it can be just sharing in that moment of humanity of, wow, these are really hard times right now. How are you? And, um, and that can also help us assess for burden, right? So we're supporting them, we're providing, again, some of those verbal skills of just checking in with them. And then we can expand that into, okay, maybe this is someone that I can work with to provide support to a patient, or maybe this is just someone that I should have on my radar to check in with as far as staff. Staff support can also mean music, of course. So. Um, for me, that has meant expanding some of those uh, discussions with nurses as far as scheduling and saying, oh, do you have a song that has been, that's on, been on your mind this week or since the pandemic started? Or do you have a song that's just been playing that you've been listening to a lot? And uh, that personal connection then turns into a video I record of that song they selected is then blasted to all staff and it is selected by and in honor of this nurse. So now we are honoring their contribution to a, st a staff support video that is being sent to everyone. Um, so that's another area where um, we can just consider the expansion of our role using both our verbal toolbox and our musical toolbox. For patients, we want to be considering um, the risk for harm. That's why I really use that idea of translator. We need someone who um, can tell me how they're responding and if there's any history of anxiety, agitation, pain, shortness of breath, that means we need to assess that with through a nursing staff as much as possible. So whether that typically, ideally, that's our nurse. Again, we know there's barriers to that but um, we want to both educate someone on how to, to assess for that harm, especially if we're doing straight telephone, um, or we want to go through the nurse, or we may want to consider holding off until that's a possibility. Um, patients have a choice of medium now. I found that some folks thrived on not being seen. They loved the idea that I could not see their condition. <laughs> and um, they reported that. They said how, when I gave them a choice, oh, I think we can do video through the nurse today. She would, there's this one patient who was like, no, I, I kind of like the mystery. I like, you know, not being able to see, but still being able to connect. Um, so it also is this opportunity for honoring a patient's dignity and choice and, um, and maintaining their dignity. And my theory is that for some folks um, who are physically declining, who would have to be seen within that physical decline, um, now can just be heard as the person underneath the disease, particularly for those who are, again, alert oriented. Um, but when we give them that choice, it gives them another way of, of taking some control out of a situation that has become even more out of control. And then for families, we want to be thinking about phone burden. So uh, how many clinicians are trying to call them this week? How many clinicians are trying to use um, their phone for telehealth, how many family members are trying to connect with them. Um, what I've noticed as well is uh, an increase in participation in music therapy with families because they are the ones holding the phone. So if that phone burden is not enough of a barrier to prevent music therapy, then um, we can connect with them. And now the family member is staying with the phone and they're um, able to sing with them or they 
are staying to witness how their loved one responds. And some of this is because it's shelter in place. So now they're home instead of working um, out and about during the day. And, um, and now the family has more contact with the patient, which can be both a burden and a benefit. So now that's where that increased need for the family and where some of that time might be just for the family is because now they are really witnessing that decline and being present for what the, the patient is going through. And then I just wanna to briefly touch on current practice um, because all of the information leading up to this is really that telehealth focus, which I'm still doing, still doing some phone, straight phone visits, I'm doing some FaceTime and I'm um, doing in-person, but my in-person has been increasing more. So sometimes I alternate. Um, depending on the facility, it decreases burden on the facility scheduling and comfort level if I do telehealth uh, instead of doing in-person twice a month. Maybe one of them is telehealth or over the phone and one is in-person. Um, I'm very conscious of if the family is having a hard time and is trying to advocate to get in person, then I will go to the phone or telehealth. I prioritize the family trying to make that in-person contact in my practice. And so that's why keeping that flexibility of between phone, telehealth, and in-person um, can be really helpful in this current time. And then of course, assessing and reassessing accessibility. Um, car office has expanded to phone and telehealth center, back seat, set up the camera, um, portable, and so I might walk out of a visit and be doing a session in my car. Um, and then of course, in-person considerations, follow wherever you are working, but you want to consider preference. Are they comfortable with you coming person? PPE, is it available to you? Do you have the appropriate PPE depending on the situation? Um, your own supplies, what are you bringing in? And uh, the, the space, the, is the space conducive, the home space of the patient that you're visiting conducive for you to continue visits in person? Do you wanna try and do it outside of a door versus going inside depending on um, the space and the limitations? So I think now I am going to be asked questions. And here are my references just for the video's sake. Um, while I don't specifically cite these references, when I'm talking about those interventions, they really are evidence-based interventions that we're adapting into the telehealth world. I do not have any references on specific music therapy, telehealth. I don't know if there's any research on that, but if anyone has any, feel free to put that in the chat and maybe we can send that out to folks. Wonderful, thank you, Brittany. And uh, there are, um, right now I don't see any questions in the chat, but as uh, I ask a few of them, I encourage uh, if anyone has questions to go ahead and, and put those in. Um, but the couple questions that, that um, I had for you, Brittany, um, so, how have you maintained relevance throughout the pandemic and during these times of change? Um, I think the main shift to maintain relevance was taking on new roles. So that included primarily that staff support role um, and trying to keep people connected and sharing efforts to keep people connected. Um, trying out new modalities. I remember the first week of shelter in place in California. I did my first phone visit and um, I asked my manager if it was allowed because I was not allowed to go in person. <laughs> there was no code for me to, um, to, uh, to put in a phone visit versus a regular visit. And so I got a sure and so i did it 
Uh, I just did it with a spouse and I said, I'm sorry, I can't come over. Are you okay putting it on speakerphone? And they had like an old phone. This was with an elderly couple. This was not a smartphone. This was, I knew which phone they had because they had put someone else on speakerphone when I was there before. I knew it wasn't the best sound quality. I think the patient was even sleeping, even though if I was there, they typically would wake up. And, um, and the spouse, um, started singing with me through the phone to um, his, his loved one. And that was my first straight phone experience that I could report immediately to my manager and say, look, I can make visits. I can make phone visits. Um, so that I think was a key, key piece of, of staying relevant and staying um, in my position and just having to kind of prove, especially in those first few weeks, that music therapy had a distinct role that both myself and my colleague had plenty of work to do <laughs> and that we could continue to support patients and families. Absolutely. It sounds like uh, you were, um, you adapted to the, the circumstances and used your resourcefulness, which um, really worked even in the case of that simple phone that that patient had. That's such a wonderful yeah. story. Well, so thinking of that first session as, as we go into, um, you know, further developments during the pandemic. Um, so as you, um, I would imagine you sh you're, you're shifting to a hybrid model. And um, at that point, um, how do you foresee the shifts in the pandemic's development impacting um, your practice? I think, um, I think expanding the definition of flexibility and also expanding the definition of some of our music therapy interventions. Um, so a lot of those that were listed, we would traditionally say you would be doing in person, you wouldn't do that over the phone before you go in person for an initial assessment. And um, so some of the things that have really stayed the same is right, that flexibility, that coordination with team members and that adaptability. I would just, you know, multiply it by at least 10,000 and then you're getting closer to what you need in these different times. Um, and then um, I think developing, um, right, this, these definitions around telephone visits, these definitions around telehealth visits, um, being able to assess um, what is the most appropriate modality for someone that was not something that I got in my education. I don't think anyone necessarily did. Um, so now we have to add this to our toolbox of, um, do we know uh, which modality is gonna work best for now and how to reassess that? And when we might have to discontinue because the modality that's available um, is not going to be the best modality, or maybe it's not the best for now and we need to check in with them in a month or two. Um, so being able to shift back and forth and, and also preparing families to shift back and forth. Um, so there's a lot of times when I'm telling a family member, um, I got to visit in person today. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go tomorrow, or I don't know if you tried to go, if that would still be available or right now I'm, I'm doing it, uh, through video and, and FaceTime but I might try and ask if I can go in person next time and I'll keep you posted. And then by the next time it comes around, I hear that a facility or the caregiver in the home is really stressed and I say, you know what we did FaceTime again and this is the benefit, you know, and this is how it went. Um, and for now, you know, so I think um, having that tentative language and staying in that tentative space so that Families are also prepared for that flexibility and team members are prepared for that flexibility moving forward. It sounds like when you're talking about um, almost developing a future assessment tool, um, that's another tool that's going to be in your toolbox. Um, do mm -hmm. you see any others um, that or others in terms of expansions of your tools that are, are needed as the COVID-19 pandemic um, persists? I definitely see the expansion of legacy modalities and also the expansion of um, what can we do between sessions. And that might be using email, that might be um, 
giving more direction so that education to the family member on the use of music, we might really be following up on it the next time. Um, so I definitely see an expansion of what are the tools that we can give between sessions and what communication can we have between sessions that make sense and are accessible, particularly thinking about email. Um, there's definitely been an expansion of my verbal techniques and particularly what kind of verbal techniques and questions can translate into music interventions. And then overall tech, technology competency, um, which I know has been a continued discussion in the music therapy world. And now so even more, okay, I'm making staff support videos. Do I know how to get the right sound quality? Do I know how to position the camera so that, um, and how to stay low tech, but with as best quality as possible. Um, what technology is available to patients and families now? So I loved doing a handful of video conferencing with families before. Now it's going to be everybody probably has that access or hopefully will, if they have that access are using it um, or if they have um, certain technology, I, that might be another part of my assessment. What technology is available to you? Um, and that might expand how we can link in family members, not just thinking in the safety um, context of COVID-19, but also in the loved ones that are on the East Coast or those who can't travel because of, of COVID. And I, I've heard many colleagues who are doing that. Um, and unfortunately, it's really not the best way of connecting family members, particularly when we're thinking about those who are actively dying. Um, however, it is, it is a, a part of our toolbox that I think is important. Thank you for that insight. Now, as we were speaking, um, some questions began to flow in. Uh, so I think uh, we should uh, get to some of those because there's uh, quite a few in-depth ones here. Um, but the first one, uh, uh, for Lori Sunshine, have you seen any clients with COVID-19? I have not. My colleague has. Um, I didn't know if there was anything particularly around um, COVID-19. When they're in the home, typically um, the psychosocial team is not going to go in in person. Uh, the reason that I wouldn't be going in in person for that reason is really thinking more about PPE. It might be on the thinking a little too conservative, but I am considering the nurse has to go in when someone has COVID-19 positive. So I wanna make sure that there's enough PPE for them and that we have been trained and equipped in all of the PPE we would need to wear if someone tested COVID positive. We do have N95 masks. We do have face shields. We have, you know, things, everything else, the gowns, gloves, et cetera. Um, but I think my psychosocial team thinking our social work and spiritual care, we think on the more conservative side, can we connect with them over the phone or through FaceTime with the nurse? instead until they get tested and it's been 14 days so we've had folks who have tested positive and then they get cleared and are tested negative later so we we kind of adapt with um, where they are i've also had uh, heard of psychosocial members maybe visit outside so um, they aren't actually going into the home of someone who is covid 19 positive and that's something that i've considered as well mm -hmm. And I think that answers the second question, uh, which was, uh, how are you assured that COVID-19 is not at home among family and caregivers? Uh, and what instruments do you bring ho to homes? And uh, do you see any clients from outdoors? And sounds like it's something you've considered and the other team is implementing. Yes. Um, the thing that I, as far as being assured, um, is that we do a screening um, before every in-person visit. And then um, there's a, a tiered system at my company. So there's a symbol for their COVID-19 positive. There's also a symbol for at risk. So let's say the daughter works at a COVID positive uh, unit in a hospital. Now that family is an at risk because she could be 
exposed, has a higher risk of exposure and that could be brought home. So they are trying, we are trying to track that and we, we ask those questions and ask questions about potential symptoms as well. Thank you. And uh, Lori Gooding has a question here. Um, how have you handled confidentiality considerations with things like window visits? Um, one tool that I use um, is I, I do use a voice amplifier when I'm doing window visits or it's on the telephone. Um, what that does is that means that I'm not yelling into someone's home where the, all the neighbors can hear. It's not necessarily the best protection of confidentiality. Um, I also do discuss the fact that I'm about to do a window visit with the patient and family and I do kind of name like the door is going to be open. <laughs> there is potential, like are your neighbors okay with me being outside? So. I, I almost think of it like when you think about someone's in a facility and they're in a three bedroom, how do we protect their confidentiality? How do we make sure that this is appropriate? Well, we have to check with, you know, each person, right? They're in the middle bed. We need to check with each side. Are you okay? I might, I might be playing some music. Are you okay? I might be playing some music. And then we do our best to try and create, you know, that container, maybe try not to speak too loudly as long as they're not hard of hearing. I, I almost think of it in that way. Thank you. And uh, one more question from uh, David Knott. What decision making both yourself uh, and your employer guided you when you returned to seeing clients in person? And have you explored group video sessions with family members um, that aren't at the bedside? Uh, the decision making process was really around PPE. Do we have the appropriate protective equipment to go back in? Um, the decision making was also based on what the social work and spiritual care counselors were doing. Because I'm in the social service department, it was all based similarly. If the social worker is doing it, the music therapist can do it, and a little bit of vice versa. Um, so that decision making, as well as um, there were definitely meetings and discussions around, do we feel safe? Do we feel protected? Uh, and we, and I do feel like I was given some amount of autonomy to make some, some clinical judgments, particularly when we first started going back in person, which was back in June. And then um, group video sessions, yes, I have done it. I have even done it where I'm using two different technologies, depending on what technology is available. So I have, um, I have Microsoft Teams through work. So I had one person on my family member on Microsoft Teams. And then I had FaceTime over here because the Microsoft Teams wasn't working for that other family member. And I just had a, a dual <laughs> video session. Um, I've also done, uh, uh, just recently, uh, it was a memorial-like session for a spouse of a patient on service. It had been their one-year anniversary, and we had maybe six people on Zoom through one family member Zoom, and then, um, and then having the, the, the daughter and myself at bedside. So there's definitely ways to, particularly because visitor limitations, um, depending on where you are. The one thing I didn't name is that I also have an inpatient, I also work with an inpatient unit that has only six beds. Um, I've been able to go there in person throughout the pandemic because it's a controlled environment, but places like that have visitor limitations. So there can really only be two people at bedside, but they are very generous in opening the doors. So they, they might open the doors and there can be family members standing outside. It's really not ideal, of course. None of this is, is the best way. But I do think about going back to that, that kind of bedside memorial. Um, I think about how I don't, I don't know if those family members would have been there in person anyways. I don't know if they would have gathered in the same way. Um, so there, to me, there are little bits of silver linings of now family members are connecting because there's 
an, an increased awareness of some technology that we've had uh, accessible to us for a while. Well, thank you, Brittany. And it looks like that's one of the, the last questions. So we thought, uh, I think we'll move on to our closing. Uh, if you'd like to um, uh, share um, a bit more just as, as your overview and, and for your closing, and then I just have a few comments to make at the end about the uh, next presentation. Yeah, I think um, my work in the last six months have really shown me how invaluable music therapy can truly be. And particularly in a time where there are so many layers of grief and hardship, music therapy is still really key to hospice and palliative care. And from the feedback from patients and families and coworkers and leadership at my organization, I have found that um, people are telling me music therapy is both helpful and necessary as part of the care team. And as there has always been, you know, the need for patience, flexibility, advocacy, these are all still vital. And it's important to both recognize our limitations and the elements that are outside of our control at this time. There are even more barriers to music therapy advocacy. And at the same time, there are even more opportunities for us to support others and to truly support patients, families, and staff in hospice. Well said, Brittany. And I want to thank you again for this, this outstanding presentation. I'm sure um, you'll be available for more questions in the future mm -hmm. um, from anybody who's uh, watching this or who's watching this in the future on YouTube. Um, with that said, uh, just thank you so much from the COVID-19 task force within AMTA. Thank you for taking the time um, to join us today and to uh, give this presentation. Thank you to everyone who has um, uh, tuned in here to, to be a part of this as well. Uh, we just want to remind you that um, this presentation is the first of our grand round series um, and uh, our next uh, presenter will be uh, next week, September 24th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, it will be uh, Todd, Todd Swartzberg uh, talking about experiences of clinicians, students, and service users during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I hope everyone stays safe and stays well. And once again, if we can give a virtual, uh, for the first time, if we give a virtual round of applause to Brittany for her presentation. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.